Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, ecliptic edition of the Bodybuilding.com podcast. Uh, I was in a raspberry patch eating a turkey sandwich during the eclipse yesterday. I was in the path of totality. Oh, well, good for you. Yep. Up in the hills. Up in the hills. Amy Updike, IFBB Pro NL- NLA for her athlete. Where were you? I was here at Bodybuilding.com headquarters. Out on the patio? Yes. Wearing the glasses? Absolutely. And we were listening to Total Eclipse of the Heart. <laughs> we were trying to get that to play. We, we didn't think ahead and download it beforehand. So. <laughs> Uh, my uh, my favorite local radio show did a dramatic reading of the lyrics of Total Eclipse of the Heart while um, like Ooh. I think Pink Floyd was playing, which was I thought it was an interesting <laughs> effect. Very nice. Um, now, as, as we were just discussing before we started recording, you are mother of two, nurse also still yes, uh, IFB B, bikini pro, um, breast explanter. There are a lot of things we can talk about, but also you are the carrier of some of the cooler tattoos I have seen. Oh, thank you. Uh, And I was wondering, are you the are you the most inked up person on stage when you're competing generally? You know, I feel like uh, tattoos have gotten much and much more common to see on stage nowadays. And I would definitely say there are girls on stage that have more than I do. Some do, Mm -hmm. but you have a bigger one. But I have a lot more. This tree on her back. That's right. I've seen that in in some of the photos. And yeah. it's becoming a little more accepted, too. It used to be that you couldn't really compete with tattoos if you wanted to get the higher rankings. But now, now you have to have them. they're so ubiquitous <laughs> that... Right. I mean, almost everyone has them. one, yeah. you know? It's like... Mm-hmm. Do you have to tone them down at all, or well, is no, there the a strategy? Tan, the spray tan really does yeah. kind of wash them out and um, kind of makes them blend in. Mm-hmm. But no, I don't do anything else. I don't cover okay. them or anything. Did they predate your whole com- competitive yes. life? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. I actually didn't get into fitness at all until I was about 27 years old, and most of my tattoos came from my early 20s. Mm. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Now, th- th- speaking of getting into fitness, though, we, we have a, an athlete profile video of you on bodybuilding.com that gives a little bit of backstory mm-hmm. on it. But I thought it was really interesting because you are, you are a, a pediatric nurse, pediatric ICU nurse also. At yeah. That so I actually, um, I worked in Salt Lake city, uh, at the children's hospital there for eight years and I did what we call the float pool. So I floated around to the different units, but was primarily in the pediatric ICU, newborn ICU and ER. Okay. So, I mean, this is a uh, high energy, long shifts, intense circumstances. Mm-hmm. I have a friend who's a PICU nurse and you know, it's, it's most of what she has energy for. I feel right. like, mm-hmm. um, how, how did you, or was that what you were like, or were you thinking like, I still have I still have a lot to burn, a lot to give outside of that. Um, I think getting into fitness gave me more energy. (laughs) That makes sense. (laughs) Because before I got into fitness, I really just didn't have a lot of energy to do other things um, after my 12-hour shifts. And on my days off, I was a new mom. I just mostly just stayed home, Um, didn't really do a lot of other curricular extracurricular activities. But getting uh, into fitness, I feel like gave me uh, a chance to be more motivated, set more goals, and really just be more energized about life. So what was it that really kind of kicked you, kicked it into gear? Um, being 12 months postpartum and still wearing maternity pants. Mm -hmm. They're comfortable though. They were comfortable, (laughs) but I was like, I have got to do something about this. So yeah. Hence how I got into fitness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now there from the stage though is those are two entirely different worlds, but you made that transition fairly quickly. Yeah, I did. I did not intend to compete when I started um, Mm -hmm. working out. I did not intend to compete at all, but it was kind of an exciting thought and a bucket list thing that um, led me that direction. And I just didn't realize that I'd actually be really good at it. So Mm -hmm. it was really exciting to find something that I was good at. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, so you just feel like your, your body responded immediately, like, oh, this is what I really want to do. Right. Yeah. My body responded really well. And then it turned out like that genetically, like I was, I just, I guess I was a little bit gifted as far as um, the way that my muscles were shaped and just the symmetry of my body and just and then also maybe my personality was kind of fun to get on stage and kind of Mm -hmm. be able to shine in a different way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did you did you jump like right into a competitive style training split the that advanced sort of stuff um i kind of did yeah i remember hearing i think in the video that it was like watching the crossfit games that initially sort of kicked you which is that's a totally different thing it is totally different um i think i was more inspired by the athletic look of the women on the Mm -hmm. crossfit games um but i hired a personal trainer who was a bodybuilder competitor okay so So that was part of the dialogue yeah so he really led me that direction and um and i really started to be interested in that so that's how it went that that direction. That's okay. how it went. Hmm. So it was kind of love at first lift then. It really was. I think I, it was just so challenging in a new and different way for me. I'd never lifted weights before. I'd done yoga and hiking. Mm-hmm. That's, that was my background. And so lifting weights was exciting and challenging. And it was just a little bit different, a new way for me to push myself every day. Hmm. And and I'm sure you hear from women all the time who are like, you know, I struggle with this for years and years. And it just never quite clicks for me. Click for you right away. What do you tell them? 
That's hard. You know, a lot of women are scared to even just to lift weights because usually it's men all in the in right. the weightlifting room. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just challenge yourself and um, and just see what you're capable of. You know, try to overcome that that fear and, and make yourself feel empowered and strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Weights did that for me. So, and did you get any? Um, you had such a rapid transit. Um, transformation, but did you get any pushback as you started lifting weights and started getting more muscular? You know, we kind of hear that a lot from competitors or from people who don't really understand what competing or is. Or even internal pushback yeah. where you're like, ah, you know, this, this is, is a lot of muscle really right. quickly. What's going on? I had zero pushback from myself, but I definitely had pushback from family and friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. My, my family, my parents, my siblings were all what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Don't get too big. Mm -hmm. And um, friends that kind of were like, wow, now you just go to the gym. And mm -hmm. so we don't have a lot in common anymore. So have they come kind of full circle? Are they more supportive now? I feel like most of them have. Yeah. Okay. Most of them have kind of seen that it's become such a big part of my life and that it's been something that's brought me a lot of joy and passion in my life. And so they are much more supportive. Mm -hmm. But after that first one, like you had your bucket list item, you went pretty whole hog after that, Did. right? Did. Like, it was so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't help myself. I, I think I heard you say somewhere something about competing five times in six weeks or something. Oh, like. I did do that in 2014 for my pro shows. It was more like, well, I'm getting into shape. Might as well just bang out all these shows. So, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. And then um, Nick kind of mentioned you did something very recently that's the opposite of what, of what a lot of competitors do. Right. And that's the explants, I think is what you called it. That's a term that I got right <laughs> off of your, yeah, your yeah. Instagram. No, it's called breast explant. So um, instead of a breast implant. So um, I got breast implants after about nine months of competing. No, okay. no, not even nine months. So six not in months, preparation for competing. Six months mm -hmm. of competing. Now, and did, did you feel like you were pressured to do that? Absolutely. To, okay. Absolutely, yeah. I, well, I was amazing. noticing on the national stage, I'm the only girl here without boobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was just kind of hard. And it was kind of one of those things I think a lot of girls feel super self-conscious about when you get low body fat levels, they go away. And then especially as a mom, that because it also hindered my ability to maintain what I had there. So I got implants and had a lot of problems with them. Mm -hmm. I had two other revision surgeries to try to fix the problems. Um, I had what was called capsular contracture, scar, scar tissue buildup. It was painful, mm -hmm. could never lay on my stomach. Um, totally impeded my lifting. I was never able to lift chest again, wasn't able to ever feel like I was full strength on back day. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of drawbacks to having them. Um, but and you were on the national stage without them as well. It's not like you were not able to even crack the local. It's stage, true. You know? It's true. I um, no, I actually placed second on the national stage mm -hmm. without them. Mm hmm. So yeah, no, I think there's a lot of there's a yeah, lot. Yeah, I mean it's a complicated decision. It, yeah, you know, having right. seen many many transformations on our side, I can say it's it's something that like a lot of fit women do, um, but and it's not part of their story necessarily when mm -hmm. they when they talk about it. Like it's just something that's that's there, but it's almost unspoken. Yeah, it just kind of happens naturally. Oh, right. Yeah. You see a competitor that's gone for more than two years. Eventually, it's going to happen. Yeah, right. and sometimes yeah. I, we look at these before and after pictures, and oh. we go. Wait, this isn't the same person. She, she, she doesn't discuss it, but you're being yeah. super open about it. Were you that other person before? You're like, uh, I have this. I just don't really talk about it. Um, about getting them. Yeah. So I never, I never wanted them until I got into competing. But then, yeah, when I did get them, I, I made like a, like a kind of it was supposed to be funny, like a transformation Tuesday. Like, hey, this was me a couple weeks ago. This is me now. Yeah. <laughs> So. Okay, so you are so you owned it. I yeah. wanted yeah. to put it out there. I didn't want to pretend like I didn't do anything. It was very obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it was obvious. Mm -hmm. I was. I've been working a lot of chest in the last two weeks. Everybody, <laughs> yeah, I, the gains have been incredible. <laughs> you do bring up something interesting, which is you almost have to sacrifice your ability to lift heavy mm -hmm. because it affects all of your upper body lifts: your chest, shoulders, back. Like you said, you feel like you can't really get that full range of motion. So right. True. it it does, even though on the one sense it will help you mm -hmm. aesthetically when you're up on stage, it does kind of hurt you in the long run. And I, I think that's something that a lot of competitors don't think about. Right. Yeah. The women I think who continue to lift really heavy after getting implants will notice that they look distorted. Um, they get kind of, they don't look as uh, appealing as they probably want them to look. And um, otherwise I feel like, uh, well, for me, I, I really loved that feeling of being really athletic and being really strong and being able to lift. Like mm -hmm. the way that I was lifting was, um, it was the most exciting to me. So when I got the implants and not being able to lift that way, it made me sad. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And do you and do you feel like kind of liberated now? Is it like I do. A, is your is your training just completely different? Yep, well? I'm it, able to train chest now, and I love it. Mm -hmm. When I have a sore chest now, I'm just like, 
I, I tell my husband, I'm so excited. I have this sore chest from lifting on chest day. It's just really, it's fun. It just, it feels good. And, um, and I like being more athletic looking versus the girl with big boobs. Hmm. And I, I imagine, I mean, having um, looked at a couple of the videos that you've done about this, uh, women have to just have reached out to you plenty of them. Yeah, to, to I get I get messages well. or emails almost daily about about it. Women who are suffering from breast implant illness, women who've had complications as well, um, even women who are considering getting them still, mm-hmm. just wanting to kind of hear more about why I decided to remove mine. Hmm. Right. And uh, I mean, it's it's easy to just sort of be to pull back and say, oh, if you really want to do it, do it, as opposed to taking a stand like, no, do it or don't do it. Do you feel like you? Uh, d- fall into one sort of advice or the uh, or the other at this point? Yeah, I do. I feel like I've become very biased. And, mm-hmm. and I kind of compare it to like, like say you um, go to a restaurant three times or four times and you get food poisoning every time you go to this restaurant. <laughs> Would you ever recommend that restaurant to anyone ever again? No, you wouldn't because you've had bad experience four times. That was my experience with breast implants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned breast implant illness. Mm-hmm. This is this is something that I just learned about very recently. Tell yeah, us a little bit about what that actually is. Um, so breast implants, um, silicone or saline, are both made out of a silicone shell. Mm-hmm. And that silicone shell will seep into your body as your body is warm. Um, and it warms up these uh, chemicals. And um, women are are either... Like my body was just rejecting this foreign body. I I don't think I was necessarily like sick, sick from the implants, but there are thousands of women who have silicone leaking into their body, into their bloodstream and making them extremely ill. So causing Mm. autoimmune diseases, um, like chronic fatigue, even like certain um, organ issues. Like I know a girl with kidney failure. Um, it, it's gotten more and more and more extreme. There's like a huge list of symptoms. Mm-hmm. And it's and it, what's sad is a lot of them can be chalked up to, say, like lupus or um, other kind of like unknown autoimmune diseases. And doctors will a lot of times say, oh, you just have this autoimmune disease. And it's like, well, you know, I don't have a family history of this. I didn't have this before I got the implants. Like, you know, and I think a lot of women just don't know about breast implant illness. And so they don't look into it any further to think, is it my? Is this my implants that's causing mm-hmm. me to be so ill? Some women are literally unable to get out of bed each day because they're so sick. So, I don't know. I feel like with with uh, the amount of illness it can cause, I feel like it's it just doesn't seem like it's worth it. Right. Right. I don't know. And it is it is something that um, it once it's in you, it's easy to just not think of it as a foreign object, but it right. is totally, it is a foreign object made of something that is not in the human body. Right. And freeing from the medical field, um, you know, any type of grafting or, um, uh, you know, a foreign joint, like a, I used to work in orthopedics. So any sort of like thing that's not natural to your body, your body is, is, uh, going to have a high chance of rejection. Mm-hmm. And so with that said, a lot of people are on immunosuppressants and things like that to prevent their body from rejecting. So, I think that's just something to think about. You know, you're putting something in your body that's not yours. Sure, sure. And have you competed since then? Or are you thinking of competing again? I did do one competition on June 3rd, um, so just a couple months ago, mm-hmm. um, without the implants. And, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I didn't do well, but I think there was other factors to, to play in there and, and uh, my body not peaking the way that I wanted it to peak. But, um, yeah. I think I think they try to to encourage women who don't have implants and say, hey, it's, you know, still compete. We don't judge on that, but it's you know, I think it changes your overall package, the sure. overall look. They don't your... explicitly judge on it, but it it does help with the aesthetics, right? Or the sure. overall Just appearance, looking yeah. like other people up there. Looking, it's, it's it always well, seems like there's there's you're there's up no, there with there's people. There's no box you know? that you check as a judge that says has implants. You know, you don't check right. something off, but you're looking, and it uh, it. It adds to the overall look. And I think it's very explicit that female competitors are kind of told, like, hey, if you want to move up, get in. Place. Exactly. It's a more of a wink. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it's not like a. If you want to do don't this, don't say it. But Well, yeah. and, and having looked at some of the standards, the, the difference between how bikini competitors are judged versus figure competitors, part, yeah. of, it, part of it is leanness as well. If you have implants, mm-hmm. you're not going to look as lean necessarily. So maybe you can add more size without meeting the leanness the way they'd kick you into physique otherwise? Am I, am I wrong in this? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it varies so much from organization to organization as far as like who wants leanness. You know, some people like this, some organizations prefer the softer look and the right. rounder shape. So you'll definitely have a, a advantage in those 
competitive arenas. But I don't know. I, th- I think aesthetically, just overall, it contributes to the overall because they are get, you are getting so lean. You're right. I mean, you you drop down to nothing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've had girls that I've put on stage where we had to pad them with three or four pads just to kind of give that some shape mm-hmm. to make it look like there was something there. And hmm. yeah, it's, um, you know, you're wearing a, a bikini top. Right. People want to see it filled out. Right, mm. right. So. I know. Has this experience changed how you view the project of competition and the culture of competition beyond that one I do aspect? feel like it has kind of changed my feeling on competing a little bit. Um, and also, I think more than anything, um, I feel more motivated to train and to take my um, athletics a different direction based on just what I want mm-hmm. to please myself, to make my body look the way I want it to look versus trying to make it the way a judge wants it to look. Yeah. It's almost like mm-hmm. the pendulum swung over here and yeah. now you're kind of letting it exactly find a little bit more natural range for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Okay. So what is, what does that entail for you? What is that, that focus on athleticism and all of that? What, how do you express that in your training? And Well, may, maybe by like, you know, lo- loving lifting upper, upper body a lot. I love lifting upper body and, you know, in bikini, that's not, uh, you know, it's kind of frowned upon to have mm-hmm. bigger arms or to, to lift chest a lot. It's, it's just not necessary or, or wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, of course I still love lifting lower body and I still want to, you know, build the good glutes and everything that kind of I was inspired by with the bikini comp- competing, um, but I feel like I want to be a little bit more athletic, more well-rounded versus just, you know, the small waist, big glutes, bikini competitor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I mean, your, your, your last article that you contributed quotes to, um, for us, they had a great Instagram post. It had nothing to do with competing, nothing to do with bikini. It was about trail running and Yay. hiking, right? So there's part of that yeah. in there as well. You're not just in the gym. Is that is that yeah. fairly recent or you say you, you've always been a great hiker? Um, well, so I've, I grew up hiking. I grew up mm-hmm. going to uh, a cabin in Southern Colorado. So every summer of my whole life growing up, growing up hiking. And then I lived in Salt Lake City for 15 years, which has amazing hiking. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so recently, I mean, I have two little kids. I don't get out to go trail running or go hiking every day. That's for sure. But um, whenever I'm in um, a place that has great trails, I love to try to do a little bit of trail running. It's mm-hmm. like kind of my escape. Like if I have someone to watch my kids for an hour, I'll sneak off and go do a little trail running. Okay. You don't drag them up the trail with you? You know, I do <laughs> occasionally if it's going to be short um, enough that my five-year-old can hike it and mm-hmm. I can carry my son on my back. Okay. But my son weighs almost 30 pounds, so he's a nice... Uh, that's a weight nice test. How, weight how old is he? He's just turned two. And he's 30 pounds. That is, that is a human kettlebell <laughs> right there. He's a large boy. <laughs> uh, interesting. I, it, um, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old as well. And we um, somehow got this idea, in, or my, my five-year-old got this idea in his mind that when he's five years old, he should be able to hike five miles. Aww. And his brother, who's two, should be able to hike two miles. Oh, no. And so <laughs> they sort of took, they adopted these goals. I wasn't pushing them, but we went out uh, camping in the desert for a few days and oddly enough, they're quite capable of it. You know, uh, the two Amazing. the two year old, he strutted up the trail for two miles like nothing. It's it's funny with kids, like uh, the same as with adults. It's just a question of believing if they can do mm-hmm. it, right? Because yeah. if a kid doesn't believe it, they'll start whining like crazy after a hundred yards, as I'm sure you've experienced at exactly. least once. <laughs> yeah. But if they believe it, then they just keep going and going and it's going. It's so true. Mm-hmm. And when it's their idea. Yeah, exactly. When it, it, Having it be their idea and having some snacks in yes. there helps as well. <laughs> yes. uh, is, okay, yes. so so what are, what are your goals shaping up like now? Um, so my current goals are just to kind of, well, with my, my past of competing, I really found that struggle between trying to stay as lean as possible and wanting to eat everything I saw. Right. So that was a struggle for me for a little while there. And after having my second baby and getting back into shape, um, it became much more of a natural balance for me. And that's been something I've been really enjoying. So, and then doing this last competition kind of reminded me of, oh, I don't want to be that crazy person who's like unable to, you know, stay balanced and, and, and really just the balance factor has been such a huge priority in my life. Um, I do more macro counting now versus like doing that strict dieting I was trying to kind of do in the past and really enjoying that flexibility and just making this truly a lifestyle, um, staying in a shape that I feel proud of year round. Um, and then just training because it brings me so much happiness. I, I love training. I love lifting and, um, being able to do that without having to be pressured for a show right. is kind of a different challenge, but I'm, I'm loving it. Hmm. So great. Yeah. And I mean, just the time commitment of, of training for a show is so crazy too. It do is. you feel like as you get more experienced, your training is getting s- smaller and more time efficient? Um, possibly so. Yeah. I feel like I wasn't in the gym quite as much for this last competition prep as I had been in the past, because now this time I had two kids versus one. 
and my time was really more dedicated to being at home. So I was doing a lot of my cardio at home. Um, I was taking my kids on more walks, uh, taking my dogs on more walks just to try to get the cardio in without having to just be at the gym. Mm. Yeah, and, and talking about that nutritional balance is interesting as well because that seems like it's such a game-changing idea for so many people that we that we talk to and read articles about on our side. Yeah. Just saying, you know, yeah, there's not just there's not one magic food, but actually just learning how to manipulate the numbers and just mm -hmm. kind of yeah figure out where you fit in there. Yeah, and it does feel exactly. like almost every competitor has to go through that really awful prep yeah. the first time. Yeah. The you know just nothing but broccoli and chicken and sweet potatoes or rice, whichever one you choose. And then once they do that, they're like, okay, I feel like maybe I can branch out a little bit. But, mm -hmm. you know, do you feel like that was how it was for you the first couple times was super strict and now? Yeah. Like I almost just, I didn't understand like how I could fit all these other things into my diet. I just didn't, I didn't think it was possible. And of course there's something to be said for like eating those super strict clean foods right at the last couple of weeks when you're mm -hmm. really trying oh, yeah. to dial things in. But in general, um, during my last, you know, 12 weeks of contest prep, I was eating toast and cheese every day. I was eating just foods that I liked. You know, I was really just, I was counting my macros, tracking everything, but fitting in foods that I loved. And I, I ate out a lot more than I ever had for any other contest prep without binging. It wasn't like I was going out for cheat meals all the time. I was just going out to eat, but then eating within um, my personal goals. But what about the sodium, the horrible <laughs> sodium? You'll lose all your muscle. <laughs> yeah, those restaurants are sneaky. <laughs> Uh, but do, do you feel like the awful prep um, is is a necessary part of it? Because we've talked to some people mm -hmm. who say, yeah, I did these three shows and it almost killed me and I hated it, but I had to learn the hard way. Otherwise, there was just no way to do it. I mean, I think I, I know some girls, I feel like, who start out and, and if it fits your macros or flexible dieting and they kind of just stick with it and it works for them. I don't feel like it's as common as, you know, the the hard contest prep diet and then switching to macros later, but I think some people do it from the get go and mm -hmm. probably do okay with it, especially if they have a coach who's been through that. Maybe and right, can who can guide who them, can coach them, and steer them, them clear of that exactly. that bad prep. Mm, yeah. So uh, what are you what are you filming with us these days? So I just did three different workout videos, which I'm super excited about. Um, we did an upper body day, kind of what I've been liking to do lately when I'm short on time. Mm -hmm. I'm not spending as many days in the gym lately with my kids and we just moved from Salt Lake City to Denver. So oh, okay. short on time makes me want to train a little bit more intensely. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll do like, full upper yeah, body. I'll do a full upper body circuit kind of a thing or super, lots of supersets, lots of drop sets to keep it really intense. Also did a shoulder day for muscle building. And then we did a glutes and hamstrings. One of my favorite <gasps> things to lift. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Well, how do, how do people find you out there? Um, so I'm on Instagram at fit Amy Suzanne, or I have a website fit Amy mm -hmm. And you do a lot of YouTube videos too. It seems like as well. I haven't been doing as many lately. I need okay. to do more, but yeah, I did start getting I'm more active. I'm not trying active. to pressure you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be more active about with my YouTube channel. It was a really great uh, way for me to discuss all of my breast explant surgery um, decision and kind of the recovery of that. It was, it was nice to just make a video and post it. So yeah, so I've got a YouTube channel too, and I answer lots of questions if people have questions about the breast implant um, illness or explant. Okay, wonderful. Well, Amy, cool. Amy, thanks for coming in and talking yeah, with thank us. You thank you so much for having me.